This is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm your host, Mac Pritchard. I'm also the publisher of Mac's List. It's an online community that connects talented professionals with meaningful work. I believe everyone can find a job they love. But to do that, you need to learn the skills to build a successful career. From professional networking to personal branding, you've got to get good at job hunting. This show helps you do this. Every week on Find Your Dream Job, I interview a different career expert. We discuss the tools and tactics you need to find the work you want. This week, I'm talking to Beverly Jones about how to treat your career like a business. Beth Jones is an expert in helping professionals enhance performance, address career challenges, and continue to grow. In our conversation today, Beth tells me there's no longer a well-trodden path for any career, and a job you thought might last forever may disappear soon. Beth says opportunity still exists, however, but it requires you to take charge of your career. That means you need to stay up to date with technology, learn new ideas, and meet people. Good things happen to those who take these steps, says Bev in our interview. And in her career coaching work, Bev has found that one skill is always useful, no matter what your job. She shares her secret weapon later in the show. Want to learn more? Listen in now at the Maxless Studio as I interview Bev Jones about why you need to treat your career like a business. Bev Jones is the author of Think Like an Entrepreneur, Act Like a CEO, 50 Indispensable Tips to Help You Stay Afloat, Bounce Back, and Get Ahead at Work. She also hosts the NPR.org podcast, Jazzed About Work. Bev helps professionals enhance performance, address career challenges, and continue to grow. She regularly writes and speaks about leadership, communication, and strategy. She joins us today from Washington, D.C. Bev, thanks for being on the show. It's a delight. I, I know you have a very popular show, so I'm so pleased to have a chance to talk with you again. Well, you're kind to say that. Um, our topic this week is one I know our listeners will have a lot of interest in, and it's why you need to treat your career like a business. Now, Bev, what do you mean by that? Well, I think it's perhaps a departure from how careers used to be treated in the past. It, it used to be that almost everybody felt that in their line of work, there would be some kind of ladder and they could work their way up and they'd do one thing and there'd be a next logical step. That day is gone. It doesn't matter if you're working for the government or a big organization, wherever you are, it's up to you to provide the energy and the opportunities that are going to keep you moving. And they're going to be surprising developments. It's just how careers are today, just as there are in a business. So you need to treat your career like a business, but how do you do that, Bev? What, what advice do you give to, to the clients that you work with? Well, part of it is taking responsibility and not depending on somebody else. Even if you have a mentoring boss and a supportive organization, just like um, the owner of a small business, every day it's up to you to go out and listen to your customers and listen to um, the people you're trying to impress. These could be people you're having a job interview with. These could be people who employ you now. It's very much like having customers who have needs and it's your job to listen to them, spot the opportunities and make the pitch. You take responsibility for seeing where the needs are. And then if you have to invent something new, learn something new, find a way to keep responding to the needs that are around you. So that, that sounds like a full-time job in itself. Um, Are there strategies that you see people do, or do you have examples of clients you've worked with who've done that uh, very exceptionally well? Yeah. I think when you're talking about something like this, you're really talking about an attitude shift and a habit shift. And the 
shift you want to make is to pause and notice, pause and listen. And I've had people learn how to do that by just taking a few minutes every day. Maybe they're in um, the Starbucks line. And so they're kind of stuck there and they just pause and chat to somebody next to them and try to listen and try to look for something about this person so they can connect. Maybe they work on connecting with their barista. The idea is to get out of your own head and your own anxiety and your own to-do list and develop the habit of pausing and engaging in what's going on around you and then trying to come up with a way to interact in that situation. And so you can practice that in, in little tiny pieces. And I've had lots of clients who've shifted their perception. Another way to do it is wherever you are, learn something new. When you're in a learning mode, it changes how you approach the world. So let's say you're going for a job interview and you've been learning a new technology or you've been learning a, a, a new part of your industry, instead of sounding kind of tired or anxious or, you know, whatever we might normally sound like in an interview, you've got something extra going for you. You've got something to be excited about and you've got something where you're noticing things that are fresh. So learning something new and also pausing and looking for opportunities to engage, whether it's just being more engaged in the regular boring meetings you go to, that can create the shift. And all of a sudden, you'll spot things you wouldn't have noticed before. Well, tell us more about the benefits, both of that mindset shift and acquiring this habit of learning new things. What what do you see with the clients you work with happen when people start doing those things? You mentioned finding new opportunities. Tell us more about that. Uh, I'd be happy to. And really, it varies greatly because you know, I have quite a varied um, client base. But let's say um, somebody is disengaged in, in their field. Um, they aren't enjoying their work. They're thinking about leaving, but they can't get it together to have a job shift. That's sometimes the situation people are in when they turn to coaching. And what I often do, even if they're really thinking about the shift, is I look for ways to get them energized about where they are now, because that's going to carry over to their job search. So that what I'll do is ask them to uh, notice something like, who seems to be the most engaged and having the most fun at your office? Notice them and come back and report to me how it is they interact in a meeting or, you know, it, it just depends on the situation, but I will ask them to notice something, notice something that's working. It may be notice what are the biggest trends you learned in this conference, or it might be who's the most successful person that you know in this kind of field. And if you can get people to notice, then that noticing, noticing a trend, noticing how the industry is shifting, noticing what other people need, once you start looking at openings for activity or action, those are opportunities that you can find a way to address. And the energy, if you're practicing that in your day job, that energy of noticing, responding, that habit of being aware and looking to engage, that habit's going to carry over to your job search. And it really, it is amazing how often what happens is clients all of a sudden they're having more fun at work and a new opportunity opened up because somebody asked for a volunteer and they said yes, just because that was part of what they were noticing. They make that shift and all of a sudden headhunters call or they look at LinkedIn and they see a job opening that they wouldn't have looked at before, but because they're trying to be more noticing, they think I got to try for that. And all of a sudden the person has opportunities for a shift and also opportunities to reinvent, reinvent themselves where they are. It, it tends to happen um, in a holistic way. If you have changed your attitude and changed your energy level by noticing more and looking for opportunities to engage more. Well, I know you work not only with executives on, on career coaching, but uh, also with business owners as well. 
Are there other habits that you see with people who are uh, running their own businesses that can be helpful to to job seekers or people th- who want to improve their careers? Absolutely. One of the problems that small businesses have, and I can identify with this, is that there are parts of your work, if you're in a small business, that you don't like much. I really don't like billing. I don't like the accounting and the financial parts and those kind of things. So we have to learn how to motivate ourselves to um, keep moving on the things that you don't want to do. And uh, one of the ways I work with people is first to have them schedule it on their calendar in small blocks and to keep up a pace of small things, of these things they might be putting off. What happens if you take a a tackle in a little way, something you don't want to do, you've accomplished it, and that burst of energy you get from accomplishing it makes you a little more motivated to do that next time. So managing your motivation and managing the pace in which you do the least interesting and the least exciting things is a really important thing for small businesses. And it's it's the same in any job, I think, is, is learning that you can motivate yourself by breaking things into little successful steps. That keeps you moving in the right direction when there might be times you'd otherwise get bogged down. You mentioned the value of learning new things and then changing your mindset, um, particularly to engage people. Uh, sometimes in the, mo- the most you know routine settings, like standing in the line at, at Starbucks, what are your other tips that you have for people thinking about their career, Bev, uh, for, for meeting new people? Uh, what, what, what's your advice there? Well, first of all, I, I, I know from listening to you, Mac, that you are um, a proponent of networking, networking, networking. And I'm, I totally agree with you. If, they, if people have trouble getting started, what I find sometimes is it's helpful for them to visualize their current network and their potential network and see how much opportunity there is with with people that they're loosely connected with. And the way I think of it is that your network is like a series of concentric circles kind of spreading out around you. And as you get further out in the circles, the connections are become less, but those can be the vital ones. So for me, I I think my husband and I and a few people are in the center circle and the next circle are friends we know pretty well. And then further out, maybe business colleagues. As you get to the later circles, there are people you're connected with and you might not even know it yet. They're the people you went to school with or maybe they're just uh, alumni of the same college as you went to, or there are people who live near you or there are people who work in the same uh, field and belong to the same organizations. Anytime there's a loose connection like this, that gives you a starting point for building a relationship, whether it's um, through LinkedIn, like a lot of people are doing now that I already mentioned, or uh, whether it is being more comfortable at an industry cocktail party because you have an opening line. If you, if you look at the expanse of these circles spreading out, even if you have a fairly small circle from day to day, you'll find that there are a number of people that you're connected with. And almost everybody responds if there's some kind of connection. Like uh, I, I do that uh, with Ohio University. I've been active as an alum there and I um, look on, I see somebody's bio and I see they went to Ohio University and I want to reach out to them. Maybe it's for my podcast or maybe it's I want to help somebody make a connection and I maybe I'll look for somebody who was in the same college or whatever it is. I use the Ohio University calling card and I very seldom um, am turned down and I always respond to people who do that with me. Well, I love the mental map image that you've painted there Bev, about networks and with you and your husband at the center of it and and your points about tapping into all the different communities that we're part of. I want to talk more about that after the break. 
And I know you've also got one skill that you strongly encourage people to develop that can make or break a career. Uh, and I want to talk more about that as well. So we're going to take a break and we'll be back in a moment with Bev Jones. And we're talking about why you need to treat your career like a business. I love making this podcast for Max List. It's one of the high points of my week. And I appreciate you joining me here on the show every Wednesday. If you're like many of our listeners, you probably set aside time every day for listening to podcasts. And while we only publish Find Your Dream Job on Wednesdays, you don't need to wait until next week for more career advice. There are dozens of great podcasts out there about work and job hunting, but finding them can be hard. Apple Podcasts has more than 500,000 shows in the United States, and only a fraction of these programs appear on the Apple Podcast charts. Unless you already know about a program, you might never find it. I've got a resource that can help. It's the 2018 edition of our Top Career Podcast Guide. You'll find 78 great career advice shows from around the world. I've listened to every one of these programs, and I recommend them highly. Each offers valuable advice about work, job hunting, and careers. Get your free copy of Top Career Podcast Guide today. Go to topcareerpodcast.com. Many of the hosts of these career shows have been guests on this program. Discover yourself why I invited them to share their job hunting advice with you. Go to topcareerpodcast.com. Again, that's topcareerpodcast.com. And now, let's get back to this podcast. We're back in the Maxless studio. I'm talking with Bev Jones. She's the author of Think Like an Entrepreneur, Act Like a CEO. She also hosts the NPR Dot org podcast, Jazzed About Work, and she's joining us today from Washington, D.C. Now, Bib, before the break, we were talking about relationships and, uh, and, and, and networking, and I want to talk a little bit more about the how there, you know, because as you point out, we're all at the center of these great networks of people. Often, we don't know how to leverage and serve our networks as well as we might. Can you give us some of your best tips about how to um, tap into those relationships, but also how to be of service to others? Well, one tip that I I think allows you to do both of those things is um, working on your listening skills. I I mentioned that earlier in another context, but listening is really, I, I think it's a great leadership superpower that, sometimes we're tempted to take for granted or sometimes we even teach ourselves to not listen. When I was in law school, we were encouraged to, in, in, in classes, to be thinking about what we were going to say next. And the tendency was we got better at ignoring what the student next to us was saying and getting ready for our comment when the professor called on us. And I think my whole first year at, at Georgetown Law School, I, what I really um, did was shift my listening to off and, and, and learn how to practice what I was going to say next. That is absolutely wrong in most of life. If you're leading people, if you're in an interview, if you're at a cocktail party, if you can calm down that inner voice that's thinking about what you want to say or wandering around wondering what's for dinner, and instead, refocus on what the other person is saying and actually listen. And it's almost like meditation where you kind of notice your mind is wandering and you take it back. If you can do that, then that gives you a tool that you can take anywhere at any kind of event. And so when you call somebody up, um, you're looking for a connection because you want to find out about a job, the tendency is to think, oh, I got to make a case. I got to make, I got to sell myself. I got to you know, do this and do that. When the strategy that often seems to work is to say, is it okay if I ask you 
um, questions for just a couple of minutes about your field. And if you listen attentively and in your comments show that you're listening, you may find the person's going to want to talk longer because we need to be listened to. And if you think about it, sometimes we go for days without anybody seriously listening to us. If you're the one who can deliver that, that, that real attention, you have a leg up in any kind of social encounter. Yeah, and it does require a change of mindset. Uh, in my 30s, I went to graduate school at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. We used the case study method, and everyone uh, focused on getting what we called airtime, getting the attention of the professor and trying to speak as much as possible uh, during those classes. And you can imagine, and I'm sure you had this experience in your law school as well, you get all these competitive people together in one room uh, scrambling for airtime. It's It was hard sometimes to get a word in edgewise, but to your point, people really weren't good listeners. And uh, it, I, and it is, I've found a valuable skill as well. It, what, it's a valuable leadership uh, skill also, Mac. I, I think that when you are in an interview and you aren't responsive, you aren't asking questions, you aren't focusing on the person who's speaking, they may question what kind of leader you're going to be. There's all kind of research now about what makes a great team and what makes a great team leader. And team leaders that are really strong tend to listen more than they talk. And they tend to be good at encouraging everybody to contribute. And, and so one of the things smart interviewers are doing is, is noticing if, if somebody has a, a, a good listening style, because that's going to be predictive of how they are on a team. And good listeners ask lots of questions, don't they, Bev? They do. And they don't have to be um, brilliant questions. They just have to be authentic genuine questions and and sometimes um, they have to draw a little bit of connection. Years ago, I was a young lawyer in Washington and I got involved in um, lobbying and I, I hadn't worked on the Hill. I didn't have that kind of lobbyist background, but suddenly I was going to fundraisers and events like that. And of course, nobody wanted to speak to one more young lawyer. I mean, they were all hanging around waiting for the congressman to arrive. But I was trying to learn and I needed to be there. And so I would give myself a game to play, trying to find something to connect. I, I was new, I was fresh, I didn't have great insights over the issues we were working on initially. But I would look at the game I might play would be, you can't leave tonight unless you've gotten three people to tell you about their dog. And I would kind of look at my watch and say, I hope the congressman's coming soon. I have to let out my dog. And if nobody responded, I'd move to somebody else. But somebody might say, oh, me too. I, this is the toughest thing about all these parties is, you know, I have, I have to get home to the dog. And I'll say, what kind of dog do you have? And I'd get the whole life story of the dog. And that person, because I'm a genuine dog lover, we had an authentic conversation. And what would happen is the next time there's an event and there aren't many people I know, the person who has the Cocker Spaniel, whose whole history I know, will come over and give me a report. So asking questions doesn't mean you have to be brilliant. It means you have to be real. And you have to find something you can genuinely be interested in and have the conversation be authentic. I think every pet owner who's listening is going to identify with that story. And today, of course, people will bring out their phones and show you pictures of their dogs. Yes. And I was at a conference um, last week where somebody I don't know particularly well, but the subject of dogs came up. I have one too. And, and we spent 15 or 20 minutes talking about our respective dogs. And to your point, we created an authentic connection. Um, and I think that's valuable whether you're running a business or you're uh, thinking about your career and, and possibly your next move. Um, are there other ways that you've seen the business owners you've worked with uh, uh, create those kinds of connections, Bev, uh, that can be helpful to listeners who are thinking about their career or their job search? Well, another thing is look around and see if there are ways you can help. 
when people are starting to try to consciously network, sometimes they are um, in it because they they need help and they are, they can become a nuisance because they ask everybody for help or they're handing out their card or they're linking up in some way. One really good technique is to look around no matter where you are and see if you can do your bit. If you're at an event and um, there are people who are standing alone and looking awkward, you can help by introducing yourself. And even if you're awkward, they're going to be so grateful that you're talking to them. If somebody um, needs to help pick up the coffee cups, if somebody is asked to volunteer for the next meeting, if you look for opportunities to help, that always gives you an entree. And it it demonstrates, uh, uh, I think, your open spirit. And it, it is a very useful technique at the same time. In the context of networking, the great networkers are always looking to connect one person to another. Say, oh, you know, you're so interested in this. I've got to introduce you to my friend Joe. He'd be interested in too. And, you know, I think there's some things you guys could talk about. There are many opportunities to be helpful, whether it's finding invitations or pointing out opportunities. If you help other people build their networks, it'll build yours. Now, I know many of the business owners you work with, it's a hard job, uh, even though they're the owner. With Any business has its ups and downs, getting customers, losing customers, finding great people. When you, What lessons have you seen uh, for from uh, working with business owners who've struggled with those ups and downs that could be of help to, to job seekers? Because job hunting is hard too, isn't it, Bev, with lots of ups and downs? It is. And what I say sometimes is it's a kind of a numbers game. And what you want to do is play all long shots. If you realize that you don't have to um, get make every sale, you don't have to... Um, win every prize. You don't have to come out ahead in every job search because there are a lot of reasons why something might not be uh, the right fit. But what you have to do is try enough times. If you recognize that um, maybe it's going to take 10 calls to make a sale and you've had eight without any, um, any good results, what you're doing is you are learning, you're putting in the time and you're building up the numbers and sooner or later, the numbers always start turning up wins. It's, it's very often um, a numbers game. There are going to be some failures to get to the win. And that's always the case. If you're um, in sales and often if in life, you don't win every time. Well, Terrific advice, Bev. Now, tell us, what's next for you? Well, I am having fun with the podcast that you mentioned, Jazz, about work. It's really about how people can engage in work. And so that's going to continue for a while. And that how you stay um, excited about your job, that's part of the theme of the next book that I'm working on, kind of slowly. And I'm um, continuing to, to love the the coaching part of my job. And I'm associated with the uh, School of Leadership and Public Affairs at uh, Ohio University. And, and that's exciting. So I, I feel like I have a nice mix of projects and, and jobs. And, um, you know, I just keep looking to invent the next thing and it gets better and better. Well, it sounds like a rewarding mix of Work and projects. I know people could learn more about you, your show, Jazzed About Work, and your book, and your consulting practice by visiting your website, clearwaysconsulting.com. And we'll be sure to include links to all of those resources as well as the website in the show notes. Uh, Bev, thanks for being on our program this week. Thank you, Mac. It's really been fun. It's wonderful to talk with you. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Take care. One of the images I took away from that conversation 
was this mental map, this picture that Bev drew of networks with herself and her husband at the center and all the relationships that she has, uh, both personally and professionally. And I think that's a, a good picture to have because often I meet people who say, I don't have any contacts. And of course, we all have contacts. And and I, I think uh, what's really often the challenge is people don't know how to connect with those contacts. I thought Bev had terrific advice about how you could do that. So I w- was really impressed by that. And I... You know, Bev, like me, is a podcast host, and she's one of dozens of career podcast hosts I've met in the last three years who have wonderful advice that you can use to move ahead in your career and find your next job. That's why we published our annual guide, uh, Top Career Podcasts. And uh, Bev is in there along with 77 other great shows. I hope you'll consider downloading it today. Because if you're like me, you may be a podcast addict, and we're only on the air uh, every Wednesday. So if you need good information for the other six days of the week, there are terrific shows out there you can fi- that offer it. Go to topcareerpodcast.com. Again, that URL is topcareerpodcast.com. And join us next Wednesday when our special guest will be Joel Quas. He'll explain why you need to think like a hiring manager. Until next time. Thanks for letting us help you find your dream job.